Hi everyone and welcome to UBS Trending. I'm your host, Anthony Pastore. Since the start of the year, markets have been volatile to say the least, with swings in equities as well as interest rates. And as the Fed continues to talk about interest rate increases and inflation is expected to level out sometime this year, what does that actually mean for the markets and should you expect more volatility ahead. Well, joining me now to have this discussion are two colleagues of mine from the Chief Investment Office, David Lefkowitz and Leslie Falconio. Good to have you both here in the studio. And I know that you've both been busy taking calls and talking to clients and our advisors here at UBS. So let's get right into it, David. I have to ask you, mm-hmm. clearly the volatility kicked in just about as soon as we came back from the holidays in January. What's yep. been going on out there in the markets that's been really driving a lot of this volatility? Yeah, Anthony, I, I mean, I think this is all about the Fed. Right. I mean, we're seeing a, a pretty big pivot in terms of Fed policy from one of being stimulative and, in, and injecting tons of liquidity into the economy and, and into the financial markets. And, and now with the pandemic, hopefully, you know, beginning to, in, in the rearview mirror uh, and also the labor market uh, strong and, and inflation relatively hot, you're seeing the Fed begin to go the other way, do a 180, and they're starting to withdraw some of that liquidity. And, and quite frankly, you know, we had seen the markets begin to adjust to this over the last several months. If you look at the most speculative parts of the market, you can look at non-profitable tech companies as a, as a great proxy. They had been underperforming for some time over the last several months. That sort of cascaded, and, and that underperformance then sort of uh, reached a tipping point, and it kind of spread into the broader market. What's, the, what's important, though, is that we, when we saw the, the volatility in January, you know, it was really not consistent with what we were seeing from company fundamentals. And I think now there's a better understanding of that now that we're well in our way through well into earnings season. Companies are still doing pretty well. Uh, so we, we were pretty clear. We thought this was a buying opportunity when we were flirting with those 10% correction levels. It wasn't consistent with what we were seeing in terms of uh, business fundamentals and the strength of the economy. So, um, look, I, I think the market has adjusted a lot to what the Fed's going to do. The market's pricing in four or five rate hikes already. Um, you know, the, the risk from here is that if the markets, uh, if, if, if inflation doesn't cool off and, and, and the Fed has to jam on the brakes even harder, but I think we've, we've done a lot of adjustment and I think, you know, we're probably not going to see the same level of volatility, right. although it's not going to be, you know, this year we still think will be a positive year. Our price targets suggest about 10% or more upside uh, through the end of this year for the S&P 500, but it's going to be a different environment than it was the, the last couple of years. Right. Uh, and we'll talk more about that in a second, David. But Leslie, I have to ask you, on, on, the, on the rate side, uh, we're, we're seeing these, uh, these really huge swings in the 10-year Treasury benchmark. It's, as we're filming this today, it's around uh, mid-170s, uh, spiked up to a 190. Um, but And four Fed, Fed officials have said that they would back interest rate increases at a pace that doesn't disrupt the economy, which seemed to have calmed the markets a little bit, and it's kind of versus their more hawkish statement before that. Do you think that kind of it could continue to fuel the equity rally, and what do you think that will do as far as an impact on where rates are headed now? Well, I, mean, I think that the, the move we saw in January, obviously, as, as David had mentioned, the Fed was the primary driver. Right, but there's a lot of other things going on as well. We had a lot of issuance in corporate supply. You know, there was people putting on risk. And all of this sort of moved interest rates higher in a very fast sort of what we call this velocity, which was very from 150 to 190 very quickly. And as we always say, it's not necessarily the absolute level, but how quickly you get there. Right. So since the Fed, you know, U-turned, if you will. And by the way, you know, the Fed began to turn hawkish in December. So not all of this was new news, but I think the some of the magnitude and the confidence, if you will, from Chair Powell that the economy is doing so well, that the jobs numbers can withstand multiple hikes and you know, still have a, a very good cushion, you know, sort of caught people off guard on top of the fact that we had the balance sheet unwind or what we call quantitative tightening. Now, in terms of the, some of the comments that we've, we've heard this week, it's really more about not just the, the pace of the hikes, but the amount, meaning that, say, this coming March, when everyone's expecting the Fed to move, for, for quite some time, people thought that they would move 50 basis points, which is a very large movement for the first rate hike out of the gate. Right. And I think a lot of those comments have actually calmed the markets a little bit in terms of that expectation that it will be more of a gradual 25-25 type of, of progress. Now, one thing that has changed in the past couple of weeks is that when we look at what the market is projecting 
for you know, the future path of, of the Fed funds curve, we look at what's called the overnight index swap, which is a, sort of like a proxy mm. to the Fed fund rate. And today, it, you know, it probably has about six rate hikes priced into 2022. But in 2023, it barely has one. And the reason why that is, is that now the market is shifting more towards, okay, they might hike several times now, but then they're going to do the balance sheet. And they'll use that behind the scene balance sheet unwind to tighten financial conditions to hopefully not disrupt the market too much. Right. Well, curbing inflation is, the, is part of the Fed's mandate as well. Is, 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 is that something that, and I know in CIO, there's expectations that we might continue to see inflation rise more, especially in the early part of this year, and then maybe settle in around that 2% level. So given all that, David, and obviously there are other things going on. There's geopolitical risk out there. We still have this, uh, this potential escalation between Russia and Ukraine, which now at this point we know that the U.S. is sending 3,000 more troops to Eastern Europe just to kind of be at the ready. And there's been conversations between Vladimir Putin and other Western leaders. So we don't know what will happen there. We all hope that nothing comes from this, but it's a, but it's a risk. COVID spikes are always a risk. So how do you then tell investors where you see preferences within the equity markets? Um, it's just there's so much going on out there. Yeah. So look, in our, in our base case, Anthony, and, and this feeds right into Leslie's comments, we, we think that interest rates will continue to rise. I mean, Leslie's made the point in the past that, the and I'm just sort of alluding to this, that the terminal rate for the Fed funds is just too low rel relative to where the markets are current, currently pricing that. That means interest rates will probably have to continue to rise. That's going to continue to be a bit of a headwind for the growth complex. Uh, now, I think we've, we've seen a big adjustment, and I still think where you want to avoid is the most speculative parts of the growth complex. Uh, but in general, it's going to be a headwind for growth as interest rates rise. And then on the flip side, it's actually a, a, a positive driver for, for value companies. If you think about big components of the value benchmark, financials, right? So financials are going to be beneficiaries of rising interest rates, both long-term interest rates as well as when the Fed starts to raise the, the, the Fed funds rate. Uh, we also like energy companies, um, oil prices, the, the oil price that's embedded into the energy sector right now seems pretty low relative to what we think it can get to. It's probably only in the, in the low 60s. Spot prices are, are much higher than that. So I, I still think it makes sense to have a value bias and a, and a bit of a cyclical bias in portfolios, you know, really predicated on the fact that we still, are, we still have more to go in this normalization process in terms of Fed policy and interest rates. Okay. And, you know, and Leslie, you know, in the recent January edition of the Fixed Income Strategist that you helm, you discussed continued challenges to the markets, obviously, for the rest of this year. And you said you expect higher interest rates, increased volatility, and declining liquidity as the Fed tightens monetary policy. Where does that leave fixed income investors? All of what you just said just happened in one month. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that That's it's, right? It's, it's, what, the, you must have had a January. crystal ball, right? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think I think that's no, I think that's really important though, because when we think about how we enter the year, when where we enter the year, from the fixed income perspective, spreads are very tight. I mean, as David had mentioned, um, you know, in, in his first comments, we've had a lot of accommodation mm -hmm. and both fiscal and monetary, and because of that, we have spreads compressed. Of course, I mean, we've we've had a lot of people going into that quest for yield as interest rates have stayed fairly low for about, you know, since March of 2020. So it's, it's expected to have this kind of volatility going forward. And having sort of a healthy correction within some of these, what we call risk assets, where spreads widen out a little bit, but while maintained fundamentally sound, which I mean, which I mean by healthy corporate balance sheets, low defaults, high recoveries, is actually a benefit to investors. And that's the kind of thing that they should look for. And when it comes to the interest rate side, we do think interest rates will rise. But you know, investors have a tendency just to look to the, at the previous year, right? And they don't look at history. Historically, interest rates are still very low. And now that we move to that 1.9, as you mentioned earlier, those are levels that we saw in you know, the winter of 2019. These aren't the three and a quarters that we saw in 2018. So you're just starting to normalize. And the more you normalize, the headwind of rising rates becomes less of an impact to your total return, so a negative impact to your total return. And it's our view that, yes, rates will rise. And you know what? You might even see it 225. I was going to say, we may not see it three and a quarter for no, a while. No, you absolutely, you never want to say never. No, but no, a low of course, probability, of course. I put a very low probability on it. But I mean, especially when we think about the, the right now with the Fed's sort of path in terms of the balance sheet versus rate hikes. 
But I mean, as we look in terms of what we think going forward, it's going to be this. You could see 225, you could see 230. This is not a catalyst. And more than likely, you will trend higher the first half. Interest rates will come down the second half of the year, but it's not going to be this really sort of strong headwind. And the reason why I was joking about January is because, like we said, it's it's the velocity, right? right? We just got there very quickly, but a, but a lot of, but a lot of information came out in a very short period. Of time. It's been an active month for sure. Uh, do you think investors should get used to this kind of volatility? Is this something that we should be kind of buckling down for? Mm -hmm. On the interest rate side, I think you're going to have a lot of volatility, and just from what you mentioned before, it's not it's not only going to be from the the Fed, but it is there's the ECB mm -hmm. and you know the Bank of China. There's geopolitical risks. Of there's there's a lot of things that are sort of you know normalizing. So you're going to see volatility, David, which is not the, necessarily a bad. Thing. And on the equity side, I mean volatility reigns supreme these days. Yeah, I, I think even though, as you said, the fundamentals look pretty strong. Right, I, I think that's that's the perfect way to phrase it. I think there's going to constantly be this kind of tug of war between what the Fed is doing and then the business fundamentals. I, I don't think that 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 dynamic is going to change, and that's going to lead to. Uh, continued volatility. I think the main risk factor here is that if inflation doesn't cool off as the Fed is expecting, and, and frankly we are expecting also, then you could see it in even more hawkish Fed. And, and that's going to have to be a, a further adjustment in the equity markets. Great. Thank you both. This has been a great conversation. It's something I know that uh, you've been talking about ad nauseum. You probably can think about this and do it in your sleep. So we appreciate you did it here for us while you were awake, I think. <laughs> After all the conference calls you've been on, who yeah, knows? Right. You know? I have coffee down here. Yeah. <laughs> Shots of caffeine around. Thank you both very Thank much. You. Good to see you, David nice. and Leslie. And for more information on anything, anything we discussed today, which is a pretty packed amount of information, you can visit our website, ubs.com forward slash CIO. And make sure to follow UBS on our social media platforms like LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And you can check out all of the past UBS trending episodes that we've done here on demand. You can also find it on the UBS YouTube channel. And as always, any questions you might have about your own portfolio, please make sure to speak with a financial advisor. Until next time, I'm Anthony Pastore. Have a great day, everybody. And remember to keep your eyes on what's trending. We'll see you soon.